Welcome to The Real News. I'm Eddie Conway, coming to you from Baltimore. Recently, a new book has been published about a film that has influenced a lot of people's lives, including mine, 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers. I have with me today the author, Sohel Dolazai, who is an associate professor of film and media study, as well as African studies at the University of California, Irvine. He is the author of Black Star, Crescent Moon, The Muslim International in Black Freedom and Beyond America, and most recently, the author of this book, 50 Years of the Battle of Algiers, Pass as Prologue. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for Sahel. having me, man. It's an honor to be here with you, Eddie. Okay, I'm, I'm just curious, how did you come to write this book right now at this crucial time in history, and why did you write it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, this is a film that's kind of been close to me for a long time. I remember seeing it as, like, um, a younger kid, a teenager, um, and it just kind of blew my mind in the late 80s. Um, and it's a film that kind of stuck with me, and, you know, as the world was kind of changing around me in a particular way, and, um, you know, I felt, especially after 9-11, when that happened, that this film like continued to speak to the world, you know, um, and and then when you started to hear that the Pentagon was watching the film and using it for counterinsurgency purposes, and you know, I just felt like, wow, this is an important film that I think, in some ways, is flying under the radar, and so I decided, why not write like a quick and kind of uh, short, concise book about kind of the history of the film, its production history, and its political context, and try and give some flesh to the bone that I felt like was missing, you know, um, in terms of like its relationship to what's happening in the world today. Mm. Well, early on, I think I had mentioned to you that I had actually watched this film uh, as a member of the Black Panther Party in 1969. Uh, but while I was in prison, uh, I actually organized a group of anti-war veterans into an organization. Uh, and uh, we made a request to get the Battle of Algiers in. The administration thought right. that it was a, a, a war film. Uh, they approved it. We brought it in. We had a group discussion on it. We talked about the tactics of it. And it was instrumental in helping to organize and raise the consciousness of those veterans. But this was like in 2002, uh, before the war. Uh, why do you think? Uh, the film is important now. Uh, it's being used by both the left and the right. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it on the one hand, it tells kind of like a story um, about a group of people who are trying to resist um, and reclaim a, a kind of dignity against a uh, colonial and imperial power, right? And I think increasingly and unfortunately, that history of colonialism is, has, not, has not ended. In fact, the war on terror has in many ways extended that old history of colonialism. Um, but we also see it taking place here in the United States um, in different ways with kind of police occupation of primarily black and brown communities. And so I feel like the film in many ways is still relevant in terms of kind of providing a, uh, it, like a, an, an allegory, if you will, but like also just like a blueprint for thinking about like how people can resist and giving dignity to that resistance. I think that's one of the powerful things about the film is that it gives dignity to people's resistance against those forces. Now the right, I mean, I think this is part of what I talk about in the book, you know, like for these right wing dictatorships and, you know, like the U.S. Pentagon and, you know, military regimes all throughout uh, time since the film was released, you know, they see themselves in Colonel Matthew. You know, they see themselves as the French, and they're trying to figure out how to crush these kind of rebellious or, uh, you know, insurgent forces. And so I feel like, you know, with the way in which the, wor the world has been kind of shifting, not necessarily changing, but in terms of like shifting from Europe to the United States, and the way in which these forces are continuing to kind of like oppress people, um, you know, the film provides a way that you know, those pe the, the people who are being oppressed can see themselves in the Algerians. But unfortunately, you know, those who have more guns are seeing themselves in Matthew and they're learning a lot from the film as well. So I feel like it's an interesting film to think through some of the kind of currents that we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things is that this 
film based itself on urban guerrilla warfare, primarily the, the around the Battle of Algiers. And I'm wondering with today's uh, uh, new movements afoot in South America, in Africa, uh, in Europe, so on, with leftist groups uh, using electoral politics, taking over governments like Venezuela or the MST in Brazil, or the, the mine workers in South Africa, or the or organizing in Spain and Greece. I mean, it seems to me that small unit guerrilla warfare is no longer rele relevant uh, to the day's struggle. Uh, does that make this film say unnecessary uh, a lesson there? I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, part of, part of the moment that the film comes up in is uh, an era of decolonization where it's kind of worldwide rebellion in, in, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and amongst black and brown people in the United States against kind of white, ra a kind of white racial capitalism, right? And, and, and you had a kind of bipolar world. You had an alternative that was called the Soviet Union, Russia, socialism, however you wanted to see it, to that, that kind of power. Um, today, that doesn't exist. Um, and so you have kind of just rampant authoritarian global capitalism. And so as a result, now groups that are trying to resist it, where, is the, where are those alternatives, right? Where is a real way that they can kind of like ideologically, but even like diplomatically or politically like hang their hat on, so to speak. And so because of that, yeah, I think electoral politics is one avenue that groups are, 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 are using to try and get some sort of remedy for what they're dealing with. But I think the question that you're asking also speaks to um, how do we think about armed struggle today, right? And, 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 and in what context is it necessary or useful? Um, and I think one of the things that I tried to talk about in the book was how in particular the war on terror, right? It, it coded the idea of armed struggle as uh, as, as illegal, and they called it terrorism, quote unquote, and they declare a war on terror. And, and so terrorism has taken on a, a very different kind of meaning today. And I think it's really about kind of containing and disrupting and undermining any possibility of armed struggle against these kind of more oppressive government forces. So people don't see armed struggle as even a possibility when it comes to political mobilization. I'm not suggesting, um, nor did Fanon when he argued it in Wretched of the Earth, mm -hmm. that violence is you know, indiscriminate and absolutely necessary. Violence and armed struggle are a central part of people's quest for freedom. And they have to be seen as part of a larger toolkit that groups use. The FLN in Algeria, they used armed struggle, but they also used diplomatic means. They went to the United Nations. They tried to make appeals along various kind of traditional electoral uh, political processes. But armed struggle, they felt, was a necessary component to the work that they were doing. And so to me, it's interesting and why the film is still relevant in many ways is it hopefully forces us on the left to ask those very serious questions um, about what and when is armed struggle possible or even necessary? I think in the current moment, armed struggle has been, and th the idea of political violence has been coded as, a, as Muslim. And they put a particular face on who does that kind of violence. And, and as a result, there's a lot of ideological work that's been done to code that kind of uh, activity as illegal and worthy of death. We need to kill those people, right? And so I think as a result, even on the left, people are reticent or hesitant to kind of align themselves with, you know, overtly Muslim causes or causes that Muslims support because they feel like there's a teeming or propensity toward violence within those groups or communities or those movements. And it's, it's served in many ways to legitimize the power of the right because it's fractured, I think, potential alliances that we on the left could have because of that question of violence sometimes. You know, it's, it's, uh, this whole war on terror itself, as, as you say, it's, it's right now, it's coded in such a way that it targets Islam and it targets Muslims. You point out in the book, it, it makes the Western civilization say that Muslims, uh, Islam, uh, 
it's the code word for savages now. Right. It's, it's the same thing they use against the Native uh, Americans uh, uh, initially. Uh, it's the same thing that they use when they say thugs in the black community, right? right. Uh, but I've just noticed recently with uh, Trump in there that uh, there's a pushback. And, and, and what I realize is that there's a billion Muslims in the world. Right. One billion. Right. And the pushback seems to be strong. And I'm wondering, is that same sort of uh, the Western society is decadent, the Western uh, 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 civilization is uh, decaying, uh, uh, these really are, are close to non-human beings. Is that same thing happening in the Islamic world among those billion people in terms of how they see the West? I mean, I think like it's hard to speak in uh, in one way about like as you said, one point you mm -hmm. know, three or four billion people, right? Twenty four percent of the world is Muslim, one in, almost one in four people. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to speak in kind of you know broad brushstrokes. But I do think that like. There is, as a result of what's been taking place over centuries, a, a, a deep skepticism, if not outright criticism, of what the West claims. The West claims to represent one thing, right? Ideals of freedom and democracy for everybody. But clearly that's not what's been put in practice. Um, and so the experiences for not just those 1.4 billion, but the overwhelming majority of the non-European, non-white world has been one of subjection, of, ex of, of, of extreme violence, of um, a, a, an undermining of self-determination, the exploitation of national re natural resources and labor, right? And then, you know, outright war in order to enforce those uh, those. Um, ideas, and so it's not just the Muslim. It's not it's not just Muslims in the world who have a deep kind of skepticism and criticism of the West. And I think part of I think what we're seeing in the current moment, and I think part of again why the film has a particular kind of resurgence, is we're seeing figures like Trump and Obama in a different way, but Bush before him, right? Like there's a crisis in the West, and there's an attempt or desire to maintain control of the non-European world, right? Still having access to those resources. And I think that's why we continue to see the rise of a figure like Trump. I mean, Trump is saying, make America great again. He's trying to go back to a time where for many of us was a very brutal and uglier time, if you, some might say, than now. Um, but it's also about the West. I mean, you know, he, it's, it's no coincidence that he meets with Theresa May and he talks about the alliance between the British and the United States, right? So this is about empire, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Trump's resurgence can't be seen as separate from what's going on throughout the rest of Europe in terms of these far-right movements. And those are a response to like um, an exacerbated kind of instability and precarity as a result as, as, in relationship to the non-European world. And so part of the reason why I wrote the book and why I think the film is still so relevant is because that project of decolonization that the Algerians and the rest of the third world were trying to fulfill, right? We wanted to be free. We wanted to be self-determining. That project has never been like a finished project. It's still an ongoing one. You know, the third world, as it were, never got its freedom. And the power shifted from the European, the British and the French, not to the United States, and we're still in this place where those struggles are still happening. So I don't see um, the war on terror as a break, as many do, like 9-11 as some sort of rupture or break from what came before it. It's really just an extension. It's a different chapter in a longer Euro-American project of um, hyper-exploitation of the non-Western world. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna pick this up at part two. So thank you uh, for joining me, Sohil, and thank you for joining me at the Real News.